All right, we get the point. Two people died, one of which was Joshua Frederick Welzer and Tommy Dean Welch. So what I wanted to show you guys next, this would be like the part two of this uh, segment, would be how does this case end between Pazuzu the cannibal murderer and the mental health facilities in the prison system? So Pazuzu, to give you guys a real quick background here, you know, he was locked up May 13th, 2015. And so this, the video footage I'm going to be showing you is the criminal justice system trying to move Pazuzu from one location to another, continuously rotating him because they didn't have the ability or the training to be able to deal with somebody at his caliber because allegedly this guy wouldn't stop trying to kill himself. Here we go. We often, as Americans, like to listen to the narrative of the police and the court system and the education system. And the reason we like to do that is we like to think that those systems are working for us. In North Carolina, our justice system has made it really difficult for the public to ever peel back the veil and see what really went on. This morning, the sheriff's office was notified that Pazuzu Algarod had died while they were at Central Prison in Raleigh. Mr. Algarod was discovered shortly uh, after 3 a.m. He was unresponsive and had a wound to one of his arms. Mr. Averrod was sent to the adult corrections at Central Prison on a safekeeping order. What we know from the autopsy and from what prison officials have said is that he used some kind of instrument to cut himself. And what they said is they don't know exactly what kind of instrument it was. Pazuzu was held first in Forsyth County Jail. We had heard from corrections officers off the record and from other inmates that Pazuzu had been trying to bite through his arm and trying to do so rather dramatically on the full moon. He was transferred out of there because he had been biting himself there. Jesus. So they couldn't stop him from biting himself. They found the guy death. in an eight by 10 cell and they found all of his other personal effects. So it's kind of hard to understand how they possibly couldn't find the weapon. He gets sent away from the Forsyth County Detention Center because they say they can't take care of the guy because he keeps trying to kill himself and they can't stop him from doing it. So the people in central prison know what he's apt to do. Somehow he gets time to be alone long enough to chew into his arm enough to bleed to death. It's very important Jesus. to understand in North Carolina that the Department of Public Safety oversees the Department of Corrections. So when there's an incident such as the suicide of John Lawson, they're tasked with investigating wrongdoings in an organization that they're also managing, which seems like a conflict of interest. Our We're going to go back to that part. Got rid of the Dorothea Dix forensics unit, which is where we used to send people with mental illness. We are slashing budgets from the national to the state on mental health care. What it does is it puts all the burden back on the corrections officers to deal with people with serious mental illness. And in the prison system, about 2,500 open jobs that they can't fill because the jobs don't pay crap, they're super dangerous, and nobody wants to do that stuff, even in these little towns where they're economically depressed. Well then, all right. Where, it's like one of those, like, where do we start? And I'm going to try to keep this as succinct as humanly possible. So he started at a place called Forsyth County Jail, and he was transferred to Central Prison for safekeeping because they couldn't figure out what exactly they're going to do. Now he was found dead at 4.20, nice, a.m. in his cell at Central Prison and he died from severe blood loss. So what issues can we pull from this? Strike one, Department of Public Safety oversees the Department of Corrections. So essentially if the Department of Corrections messes up, the Department of Safety has a self-interest not to report it. So this is where we're going to dive into a couple rabbit holes here because I think it's important. And I think you guys in the long term would like to use this as a reference for the issues regarding or the flaws regarding our mental health care system fused in with the prison system. Okay, so what specific policy did they mess up? Well, they left an inmate with suicide risk alone. I'm going to read you the exact safety protocol that they have. So here's what it says. Quote, any staff may identify an inmate as potentially suicidal. When a staff suspects an inmate may be suicidal, the staff shall keep the inmate under direct line of sight supervision and initiate policy TX 111 7 self injurious behavior. Okay, so that's a really fancy way of saying, and this isn't just a North Carolina specific policy. This kind of suicide policy is a policy that's enacted in mental health institutions at-risk youth homes, prison systems, so on and so forth. So you always have to keep a direct line of sight. So oftentimes that's where you see the little jail cells with like a little like opening in it. So you open up this little hole and watch them. Or another situation a lot of times 
with uh, more like youth risk kind of housing is they have to keep the door open and watch physically watch the person 24 hours a day. However, one of the issues with that is oftentimes there's halls with lights and the lights shine in. So the person on suicide watch can't even get any sleep either. So it's a cluster of a situation. So they didn't follow this. And this individual had more than likely, more than likely because it wasn't properly investigated. This guy literally turned and bites a hole in his arm. Well, more like his armpit, and he bleeds to death on a full moon. Strike two, Dorothea Dix Hospital closed in 2012 to be sold and created into a, a park and potentially other mental health services. Now, disclosure, I am not a mental health expert on North Carolina's health infrastructure, so I'm not going to pretend to. However, I knew a thing or two about the health infrastructure inside the U.S. as a whole. So Dorothea Dix was a mental health institution. I know that a lot of us have opinions on mental health institutions, particularly throughout history, like the 1970s and earlier, where they would overly institutionalize people who wouldn't have to be in there. So this is where, you know, you would put your serial killer crazy person in with your Aunt Mary Jane who divorced her husband and decided to go on the road as a gypsy. They would pair those two together and utilize things like electric shock therapy. However, the downside of closing Dorothea Dix, which we can argue, obviously there's, you shouldn't be electric shock therapy anybody, obviously, but mental health institutions should be there for people who have a mental health crisis severe enough like Pazuzu without ingraining them into the prison system that doesn't have the resources to be able to deal with them. So they chew holes in their armpits. Fortunate, well, not fortunately, the idea at the time was that in 2001, so this situation was in 2012. In 2001, there was something called the 2001 reform package. Now, the idea was to replace expensive beds at Dorothea Hospital with cheaper community social service options. So the idea was like, hey, we're not going to put so many people in mental health uh, facilities, but we're going to have more like informal, low key places that people could stay. Well, according to Disability Rights North Carolina, so it's a nonprofit tracking these types of things. There's more than 6,000 mentally ill people who are living in often squalid rest homes and receiving little or no treatment. And so this idea that you shouldn't over institutionalize people hasn't really prospered too much. And then that also leaves the question, what do you do with people like Pazuzu so they're not left alone? Now, they also had something called Broughton Hospital that they decided to uh, make a new one, like a higher, better facility, but it was delayed seven times, which is a cluster, and it was essentially replacing the old facility. So it's not like they are creating more facilities, they're just creating, uh, updating another one, which is a problem. So strike three, lack of funding. There's 2,500 uh, prison jobs that are available in North Carolina alone. Now, a kind of side note, good thing that the U.S., prison system decided to do was that they created the Mentally Ill Offender Treatment and Crime Reduction Act, the M-I-O-T-C-R-A, which is a mouthful and a half, <laughs> probably as much of a mouthful as Pazuzu had in his armpit. That was a, a program that offered $50 million per year. And the idea was through this mechanism, the act pays to expand successful programs to divert people with mental health substances and use disorders toward alternative alternatives to incarceration. So it's like, hey, uh, instead of over incarcerating these people, let's find other methods to get them on the right path. However, that program is overseed by the Department of Human Services, which has a uh, $9.5 billion cut in 2021. Now, I'm no expert. I'm no expert. But if you're having an organization that's receiving budget cuts to oversee another organization, that kind of seems like that would not be as effective. I could be wrong. Overall, the Department of Human Services is going to expect a $1.6 trillion cut over the next 10 years. Wow. So what do we do with people like Pazuzu? What do we do? Well, I guess we're supposed to throw them in prison and hope for the best. People like Pazuzu are 10 times more likely going to prison than they are mental health facilities. People like Pazuzu with severe mental health illnesses. There's approximately 356,000 of them in prison versus 35,000 people like him in mental health facilities. Mental health facilities right now only have 28% of the beds that are actually needed. Now, I'm no expert here, but I think between the pandemic, potential Great Depression, and all these other things are going to augment and amplify mental health issues. So perhaps we shouldn't try to cut the budgets for the Department of Human Services, for example. Maybe we should keep Dorothea Dix Hospital. Perhaps Pazuzu is a really good example about what happens when you have an individual who could be studied and we could use him as a case study about what to do with people like him. But we can't do that because he had died. 
Now, we're not going to have this debate about whether he deserves or not doesn't deserve to die. What is important here is to note that it's not up to us because he died. And it was a, a result of a lack of maintenance and care on the side of our justice system. But anyway, after that, I think I'm going to need a drink or six. Thank you guys very much.